Hi, I'm here with Davey and Gabe. Hi, hello to the both of you. Hi, Al. Hey, Al. Um, hey, we have an exchange between Leslie Scalapino and Ron Silliman, and we are afforded a very um, lucid intro, uh, paragraph long intro of this, this um, disagreement. Um, and most of what people are reading in this excerpt was written by Leslie Scalapino in response to Ron Silliman, who had written, I believe, a statement in, am I, in, am I right, the Socialist Review? Uh -huh. yeah. um, and, and this really, there's so much at stake here in the way we think about language poetry and its, shall we say, um, uh, the main stance that we understand it to have taken by people like Silliman. Uh, toward the need for um, non-narrativity and anti-narrativity. And this is Scalpino, of course, as we're going to talk about, tried to do an intervention right then, but the main tale of language poetry got told in a way for decades. And now we're revisiting this to try to understand what Scalapino's reservations were right then and there from the beginning. So. I want to ask each of you briefly, this is tough, because this is a fairly theoretically sophisticated problem, um, to say what's at stake. What is the thing that Ron Silliman said that Leslie Scalapino takes exception to in sum? And then we'll get a little more into it. Davey, you first? Sure. The way I understand it is that the argument that Ron makes is that uh, non-narrative writing is singularly available to white um, cis heterosexual male writers uh, because they have seen their experience reflected in um, a normative cultural production and that um, non-narrativity is a uh, affordance of seeing that reflection available to them and that there's a kind of objectivity that makes experimental writing um, interesting and productive. And Scalapino really pushes back on that and says that there is a uh, no non-situated position, no non-situated experience, and that the act of imagining a kind of um, tiered power structure in which um, white cishet men uh, have a kind of purchase on experimental writing is reproducing exactly the forms of violence that uh, the kind of oppositionality of experimental poetry thinks it's taking exception to. So just to follow up, Dave, before we turn to Gabe on this. Um, so there's an irony here because according to Scalapino and according to I think almost any of us who would be reading this now, there is an unconscious authoritarianism in the anti-authoritarianism or the supposed anti-authoritarianism of Ron who calls his position progressive. Mm -hmm. I'm progressive because I have what you called an affordance. Some people would call privilege, I suppose. Um, I'm, I'm afforded a position that allows me to experiment and others are not so lucky, poor them. But those, but Scalapino says, poor them. All right, Gabe, pick it up from here. How would you summarize the argument? Well, so I think Ron's point, which is meant to be well-intentioned or kind of meant to be generous in a sense, is saying that because white, cis, straight men mostly uh, have been the kind of subjects of history, that history's narratives are their subjective narratives, um, that those people are in a position or a better position for experimentation's demands, for breaking down uh, the kinds of roles of narrative, of breaking down unified subjectivity, or of, uh, kind of escaping subjectivity all in total. Um, and he says that, and this is where it's like meant to be well-intentioned, he says, that because uh, people of color, women, uh, queer people have been the objects of history, to use his term, um, or that their history is not told in their narrative, they are still kind of caught in an effort of telling their own story. Mm -hmm. And that telling one's own story lends to a kind of conventional, using his term, conventional style. And the problem that Scalapino sees is not just as Davy said that everybody has a narrative, but that Ron is not, or that Silliman is not seeing that the uh, supposed objective or non-narrative 
um, style of his experimentalism is in itself another kind of subjectivity. Um, she says at one point the, that that is a unified subject, even though it's pretending to be a non-unified subject. It is a unified subject, just unified in a new way. And this is, I, I want to point out that this is um, what, what Silliman says is not um, a position only believed by, say, white experimentalists. This is a position believed um, even in a kind of reactionary sense by some people of color who are, are who argue against uh, experimentalism as a form for a minoritarian politics or poetics. As we saw in like recent debates, um, probably in the last five years, maybe 10 years, but really this is an old question. Um, there's always this kind of question in in minoritarian writing, in writing by people of color, where you're asking yourself, what kind of stylistic stakes does the, uh, does my political project hold on the page? Right, right, um, right. Uh, Davey, I want to turn to you and just throw out a thought to which you can respond then if you want to. Um, what Gabe says is that there's a, there's a strange kind of weird alliance here between the progressive, let's just call him a liberal, uh, who wants to be hanging out with the radical further to the left, um, but winds up, as Gabe just pointed out, saying something that is critical of people who are arguing that their own identity politics or their ethnicity or their ex extreme situation, their situation in extremity, means that they must tell their stories in a conventional way with a, s a single stable subject position. So there's, there's lefts and rights. That's what's so confusing about this. Um, during the Holocaust, um, many experimental writers wanted to continue writing the way they wanted to write in the camps. There's an assumption that they turn to straight eye narratives, first person narratives to tell something stable because there was so much unstable about their existence. That's a lie, actually. Most writers who were modernists and experimental went through life in extremity and still rejected the idea of straight, straightforward testimony. So I wonder if you can, so really this is one of those situations, Davey, where people might be turned off by the whole problem. People who are just getting used to experimental writing might be turned off. I mean, can't these guys just figure out who's on the scorecard, you know? <laughs> Who are, the, who are the bad guys and who are the good guys? And that, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to guess that your position is that Scalpino needed to do this because it is authoritarian and that it is just as authoritarian as the conventional writer that Gabe was referring to. That was a long-winded preamble, but you want to go anywhere with it? Yeah, there's an interesting conflation happening in this exchange that I want to hang out with for a minute and invite us to... Um, spend some time with between, and that Scalapino takes up and tries to think through between experimental writing and uh, conventional writing and um, sitting with and unpacking uh, how um, subjectivity is produced and how situated critique operates. That there's the assumption that if someone is engaging in conventional narrative, they're not thinking about the formation of the subject, that they're not thinking about um, how systems of racialization are produced, how systems of um, gender and its performance are produced. They're just saying, um, uh, I'm going to talk about my experience as a white suburban housewife, and here is my story of um, my white suburban housewife experiences. And the category of the housewife isn't interesting to me. And I think that there are a lot of writers in certainly in the Modpo curriculum, who are interested in thinking about conventional narrative, to use Silliman's term, as a framework for being able to unpack how subjectivity operates and how it's produced. And that's a, that's a conflation that Silliman doesn't make room for and that Scalapino pushes against, that what we might call experimental writing is writing that is uninterested in thinking about how conventional narrative might itself um, push against um, subjectivity as a given and might do um, subject-oriented critique. And that, that's a distinction that Silliman isn't interested in, but that Scalapino really intensively makes. Gabe, your thought in response to that? 
I think that's really good. I mean, I, I think that's really right. One thing that is, is um, really brought out here, though, is there's a market issue, I think, that is in this debate. Um, because I think in one sense what Silliman, Silliman is doing is mistaking a market phenomenon for like a phenomenon of people and human behavior and writing. In the sense that like, from a lot of the experimentalists of color, even just on the Monpo syllabus, um, a, a minoritarian or a person of color's experimentation is often not as um, interesting or sellable or uh, read as an experimental project. And often these kind of things that we call conventional narratives are the ones that slip by in a system of power that wants to cut out most of the stories. So I think Silliman's note, or Silliman's seemingly like kind of a misreading of the evidence he has in front of him where he's saying oh i'm seeing more conventional work i'm seeing more unified subjects or i'm seeing more um yeah work uninterested in breaking down subject matter coming up from people of color from women from queer people and that might just actually literally be uh based in the kind of like publishing histories uh social scenes and other things that he's moving around in so there's this problem that i think we as you know, people who think about books, who think about poetry have to deal with is how much gets pushed out. Because we know once we dig into the histories of experimental communities, how much there is there. Mm. Um, and how much that's, these kinds of things are always happening. There's always a non-conventional writing, even in Silliman's terms, coming yeah. from any formation of, of people yeah. together. Dave, you re responded to this point, but I'm gonna read two sentences from Scalapino and I'd love for you to gloss them. Um, no one is free of their narrative. My own poetic construct is similar to yours in wanting to deconstruct our illusion or constructions of reality, which I see as including the illusion that elites, in quotes, whatever these constitute, are able to have objectivity by removing themselves as critiquing subjectivity. The corollary to this is to say that radical subjectivity would seem to equal the person recognizing themselves, oneself, as marginalized, no matter what, and at all times. <laughs> what do you want to say in response to that? That's quite a brilliant point. It's a super useful point, and I think that uh, one way it occurs to me to respond to it is to take up, Gabe, exactly the point that you're making, which has to do with both um, what markets are publishing and what's accessible to Silliman, but also with uh, what Silliman understands as um, an experimental project of critiquing formations of subjectivity, that Scalapino is making the point that uh, if you see someone, for instance, in the case of her writing, grappling with the conditions of performing womanhood in the way that it's received, and you think a critique, you Silliman think a critique of uh, performing, um, performing womanhood is uh, engage, engaging in a kind of conventional narrative, then like it exposes this statement that you're pointing to, Al, exposes that they're just disagreeing about the terms of what it would mean to engage in a project of radical subjectivity, that Scalpino is calling him out on um, the fact that Silliman can't both um, critique subjectivity and do so from a position in which his own white cishet masculinity isn't brought into account, that there's a false binary here that she identifies that as soon as you're having a conversation about identity formation, you're doing a kind of work of conventional narrative. And um, she's saying that that's impossible, that in order to do the kind of work that Silliman says he's doing, he would have to be talking about his situated experience in a way he has no interest in. Yeah. Um, thank you. That's great. And I, I have thought about that. Uh, Gabe, in a minute, I'm going to turn to you and, and read a, a really powerful sentence and get your response to it. But a footnote, because we don't have time to do this, but uh, if we had an extra half hour, we would talk about socialism, the actual in, in institution of socialism at that moment and now. I mean, in a way, the Socialist Review is sort of hovering in the background here. And Leslie reports that she tried to get a, something published there and was rejected because it was too poetic, which is just a wee bit ironic given that, given that Ron's position is the pro-experimental position. And socialism, you know, the irony of socialism being conventional. <laughs> in, 
So that leads me to the sentence I want to read for Gabe. Uh, and we gloss this, it's a good one too. The word conventional, by definition, is value-laden in reference to any art or scholarly thought form implying inferiority. So conventional is another way of saying, you're not as good as I am. Do you want to comment on that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it is true in the sense that conventional is saying it can't stand out. And what so much of canon formation is, is um, claiming things to be exemplary, as in they are examples, and yet they are unique. Um, so when we say conventional, we kind of only say they're examples, you know, think of a, a conventional romance novel, we might have a sense of what that looks like. And then we have an unconventional romance novel, we have a sense that that's like something that intrudes. So it's kind of um, uh, value attribution to art experience where we say that uh, a kind of better art is an art that at, in some level disturbs or moves is like a, a favorite phrase. And a conventional thing is thought to not move. You know, that, that's the kind of idea behind that word is that it won't move you because it's basically the, the goings on, it's the ordinary. Um, so, you know, what Scalpino is pointing out is that when Silliman calls uh, the work that people of color are more in a better position to do, or, or that I think in Silliman's analysis, or need, or need like, to do. Yeah, it's like you need to do, or you still kind of, or you're still doing. Um, when he calls that conventional, I think Scalapino is pointing out that basically he's saying that it's almost, it's almost, it's almost immature, it's earlier in age, it's earlier in history. Uh, it hasn't figured out certain things that say his peers or his communities have figured out or don't have to do the work on anymore. So I yeah. think that's the value. Yeah. Um, I would like us to do two quick, each of you do a final thought on this, emphasizing what's at stake in the argument, particularly in uh, our chapter on, uh, on language writing and its aftermath and its influence. And then one more round, and so these will have to be brief, in which I'll ask you to talk about how this conversation helps us understand the canon itself of this chapter of Modpo or of the whole problem of Modpo trying to find exemplary works, to use the term that Gabe just used, and then trying to move away constantly from them so that we don't simply reproduce, you know, every document is a new sentence like, you know, like my life, like Hegenian's my life. Um, and that's important for people who are participating in this course to know that we feel ourselves about the categories. Okay, so f quick First, final thoughts with an emphasis on what's at stake. Davey first. Something that's at stake is what we mean when we say experimental writing. And um, in the history of ModPo and in conversations in, about US experimental poetics, um, we're generally having a conversation about form when we say experimental writing, uh, uses of language, um, asyntactic writing, um, formal variation, um, movement away from or unusual use of sentences as compared to sort of normative prose. And something that's at stake in this conversation is that we are always talking about race and we are always talking about gender when we say experimental writing. That experimental writing is not a formal category uh, distinct from its um, racialization and um, gender identification and class position. And something that this argument turns on is a kind of, and I don't totally know what to do with this, this is a bigger thought than there is time for right now, a kind of complex unconventional masculinity among white cis pet male language writers, um, a kind of oppositionality that Silliman identifies in which he is saying that he is both like the paradigmatic subject of history um, as a white cis het man uh, but also uninterested in a totally conventional position because he's engaging in the critique um, inherent in experimental writing. And that kind of oppositionality is complicated of both wanting to see himself as in his terms, the subject of history and in wanting to critique the fact of that position. And I think that like, that's something we can look for in other places in the chapter with Charles Bernstein, with Bob Perlman of a kind of, simultaneously hyper-conventional and unconventional white masculinity 
that helps us to understand maybe several competing definitions for experimental writing and several competing definitions that just think about the racialization of the term experimental very differently from one another. Mm. That's great. It's very helpful. I mean, for people wanting to do their literary history, you, did, you needn't go any further than Donald Allen's 1960, The New American Poetry, with its selection of what seemed to be you know, radically experimental poets. But now you look back and you, it's almost embarrassing how limited the choice is and how uh, the word privilege wasn't used, the word affordance in this conversation, you know, how much affordance the poets represented in that book had. Even the beats, the beat poets who were, you know, like Bremser or John Wieners, who were really down and out, um, there were a lot of affordances because of other things. And uh, so there, and then you just, all you have to do is go back to, let's say, the images anthology of the teens, and you get the same kind of formation happening. Um, those who can, even in, you know, when the dollar was strong against the franc and the pound, um, you still had to get over there. You still had to be there and become part of the scene and be able to go there for six months. And a whole lot of people couldn't. So things kind of got locked down and so did the definitions. And that became the whole story. Because as much as the language writers are saying they're reacting against the new American poetry, they're kind of reproducing the way it got solidified. And in turn, the New York American poets who were trying to reject the first generation of modernists basically pulled off the same trick. Um, and that, that is like the dullest and rudest, coarsest way of talking about canon formation, but that's important in the poetry scene. And I think, I think today we're both about seeing through that, but also always at risk of simply reproducing it. Um, Gabe, your final thought, what's at stake? On the stakes, yes. Probably the only place that I disagree with Scalapino, because I'd say in general, I agree with Scalapino here, uh, is this line. Um, the nature of groups is to sustain and nurture members, not to urge them to question themselves or the sense of reality established by the group. I don't think that's true in the sense that, um, as we see from the history of feminism, queer rights in the United States and beyond, uh, you know, both the Black Power Movement, uh, Latino rights and the Asian American rights in the US and, and so on and so on. Um, there's so much work in holding an identity that has to do with uh, education, cross community argument, uh, discussion, what the 70s called consciousness raising. And those kinds of uh, dis discourses or whatever are, um, a way that we hold our identities and we kind of destabilize them a little bit. And basically coming into an identity or realizing that you are forced into an identity is this moment where you, for the rest of your life, say, what, it mean, what does it mean that I hold this technology that, that is also put on to me? And as a, as a person who holds a various few of those, you know, I think that it's, it's actually better to say that while an, a group wants to bring you into it and wants to say what it means to be part of the group, that entire process is riddled with moments of destabilization of those very concepts. So one could actually just reverse Ron Silliman's formation in the first place and say, uh, you know, white straight men are not in a great position to do experimental writing because uh, their identities are not so obviously held or discoursed about. So actually um, people of color, gay people, women are just in a much better position to do experimentalization. That's a thing you can easily do. Um, and I think that, you know, it's not something I would do, but I think the stakes of this argument is how our forms for living end up as forms on the page. Um, and we make a lot of assumptions about what that process looks like, and we really activate uh, our assumptions about that in a lot of these interactions in our magazines and our socialist reviews and everything else. So I think those are the stakes. That's well said. Okay, so I don't envy you. Um, you, uh, you. You have maybe two minutes each to say something about what this conversation has to do with Modpo, any part of it or the general project overall. I can think of some obvious things, and we kind of already said some things, but Davey, what would you say in a couple of minutes about that? 
Well, one place to go with that is to pick up on Gabe, your uh, extremely useful point about uh, the kind of argument that Scalapino makes about the nature of groups and to think about the nature of the group that Modpo is and to think about the ways in which folks active in the Modpo community really do spend a lot of time um, urging Modpo folks to um, question relationships to, um, to place and to language. And something that's important about this conversation is that it has the um, implicit framing of being between two Anglophone US poets and the community of folks involved in Modpo is um, a much greater um, geographic and linguistic diversity. And I think that uh, the group formation of Modpo comes through a process of questioning just inherent in grappling with um, this uh, mostly US-based archive. And there's something uncomfortable about that. And it's the discomfort of that process that makes the procedure of group formation and reformation in Modpo mm -hmm. useful. And um, I think that maybe somewhere else I would hang out with and disagree with the statement that Gabe, you were just talking about is to um, think about groups as constantly in the process of being rearticulated, of being reimagined. And that's a thing that like in a community of tens of thousands of people in Modpo, we have to do all the time. Because like if you're dealing with five people in a discussion thread, you're dealing with a tiny subset of what you understand a larger community to be. And that interaction changes what you understand a larger group to be. And so something that this discussion helps us do is to understand that as participants in Modpo, even as teachers of Modpo, we are both uh, limited by and um, framed by our, um, our relationship to the material and our subject position in dialogue with the material in the course that hopefully thinking about this conversation makes us better listeners to one another and makes the partiality of how we might find this work available to us and us available to it um, increase the urgency of listening to others as they engage with these poems. Wow. <laughs> you can smile now, Davey. That was, <laughs> my wow was praised. Um, that's amazing. Do I get a footnote before we turn to Gabe? Oh my gosh. I just have a footnote on that. That's such a brilliant thing you just said. Um, I've been really thinking hard about, for lack of a better term, the aspect of crowdsourcing, the aspect of the tens of thousands, um, actually because we leave the door just slightly open, because otherwise we're talking heads and, you know, sitting at a table and in Zoom and so forth. We're the ones, you know, who get to speak. Um, but there's something about the much larger and more diverse geographically and otherwise group of people who wind up driving the thing. The poems at a certain point, this is weird to say, take a second, a back seat to the conversation that has its own um, reality, its own formation. And it is constantly in flux because you don't know how many thousands are coming back and how many thousands are new. And they're constantly regrouping. You could call them a group. And we do refer to them almost as a singular, the Modpo community, but it is just like the world in the sense that it is all over the place. And we are not as all over the place. And therefore we take our cue from that which is truly all over the place. And it does drive us. It drives the, those of us who, in your formula, formulation, who are able to listen a little bit, at least. That just, so that, the, so that even if the syllabus were completely locked down, which fortunately it isn't, we would still have people driving us toward a diversity of views, subjectivities, linguistic cultures and just plain old interpretive opinions despite the fact that we would like to hold on to a canon we can't it won't happen in a situation like this and i believe it's relatively unprecedented not modpo uniquely but i mean this whole idea that technology has enabled all right uh sorry for that footnote gabe so a modpo point relative to this yeah um one, I, I feel like your footnote took it so much farther than I could probably go in my two minutes, but let's see. So here's what I'll say. Um, to make a given week of Modpo, um, we basically take a small kind of model 
of various social communities and how they simulated themselves and documented themselves in books and papers and things like that and how those documents moved through history and then how those documents moved through critics and how that was reuptaken and uh, then we kind of figure it out as we go from there. And the problem is sometimes that those people didn't even think of themselves as being part of the groups that we may lodge them in now. We, you know, we make some odd combinations that really work well together actually, but you know, we're not their own. So I think what's important for thinking about, uh, if you come to Modpo as a person who's like, I wanna learn about the history of American poetry in the 20th century, which you'll get a pretty good sense of from us, I think, is that that is a sense that is gonna be constantly changing. And what you are getting if you come to Modpo is 2020s or 2012s or whenever you started, that year's sense of the 20th century in American history as we do it. And, um, you know, I think that matters. And as a person who is part of groups and writes about what being part of groups is, and also thinks of himself as an experimentalist, whether I like it or not, uh, I think that one of the great things about a kind of um, identity in experimentation is that identity is this kind of um, amazing technology that moves through our lives. And we get to kind of simulate it on the page and then blow it up and not blow it up to destroy it and not live with it, but blow it up so that it's big, like, a, like how you blow up an image on a projector. That's kind of how I think of it. Mm, yeah. So I think so many people are interested in that project on our syllabus and all of us as teachers are interested in it and we're you know, figuring it out with a lot of great students. Yeah, I like the implicit uh, guidance about tone and attitude in what you just said. I'm probably miss miss restating it but it seems to me that what you're saying is there's there should be a lot of blowing up but there also should be this kind of glee or rejoicing rather than teeth grinding and constant consternation about the challenge if the challenge is not fun is not the right word but if the challenge is not pleasurable in the intellectual sense right then nobody's really going to do it. We're going to be, it's going to be all out war, which actually happened in some of these movements, right? They split up because people got really mad at each other. And I noticed that in, uh, at this point, as at the moment of this recording, almost, you know, nine years of Modpo, um, the thing moves because we want it and let it move rather than fight it out. And the winners get to dominate the choices and the, losers go away angry, right? There's some going away angry when you have a community this large, but for the most part, people adapt, they learn, and, and they kind of like each other because they're being constantly challenged. Hey, David, did you think this conversation was gonna go exactly the way it went? I mean, of course not. I thought that uh, what the we hell would, <laughs> I thought that we would, you know, um, I'd, usefully side with Scalapino and explain why her orientation is, um, for the most part, our orientation. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that like, to, this, uh, to the extent that we're able to scale up that orientation to talk about the way that we narrate canon formation um, mm -hmm. intentionally as a process that Gabe exactly as you were saying mm -hmm. is always being negotiated. Um, that's what she's asking for. She's asking for um, thinking about uh, the formation of groups, uh, work that we're doing when we put together a syllabus and when we remake a syllabus um, to be work that is um, intentional and thinking about subjectivity and thinking about the power involved in group formation and reformation. And that's work that we're always trying to do. So uh, to the extent that we had that conversation, I hoped we would have that conversation, but that's all the expectation I had. Yay. Well, thank you both, Gabe, Davy. This was a lot of fun, and I thank really you. appreciate um, Davy. You're bringing this remarkable piece to our attention again, so that we could talk about it in the context of Silliman. So, thanks, thanks to both of you. Thanks.